I'm going to talk about current events, but we have to understand history or we're doomed to repeat it, so I'll do a little bit of history. I think most of you know this, and you're probably going to want me to go fast, um, plus kittens. So ES6 is happening. People sometimes don't believe it. We'll get into that. Maybe there's some things we're doing wrong. I want to talk about that because the community counts a lot with me. And then I'm going to demo parallel JavaScript. So when I went to Netscape and I had 10 days to do this demo where that became shift, it wasn't just you know, mismanagement in Netscape. There really was uh, Microsoft bearing down on Netscape. And VBScript was looming. So uh, I missed the morning talk about what might have happened if it hadn't been JavaScript. It would have been VBScript. So thank God. Uh, and then you know the name sucks, but what are you going to do? Um, it's really funny. The Intel folks we've been working with want to call River Trail parallel JavaScript, so they're going to Oracle to ask for a trademark license. <laughs> this is probably not going to work. Um, Sun used to be very jealous. They went after a man of middle European descent whose surname was Yavanko. They said, your name starts with J-A-V-A. You cannot use this as your vanity domain site. We will sue you. Um, and he got them to cease and desist. Um, so I've been talking about how we make standards in the Harmony era, and it has its ups and downs and pluses and minuses. It's kind of a little soap opera. Uh, but it is making progress. If it weren't, we wouldn't do it. We'd do something else. That happened with HTML and, and so on. That was the what WG. We actually realized in 2004 the W3C wasn't interested in HTML or the web, so we created the WG, did HTML5. But JavaScript is making progress in ECMA, and I'll talk about that. Um, ES3 was the last big addition before ES5. That was a long time ago. Since then, people learned how to use the language well, computers got faster, JavaScript got faster, some important APIs came along. ES4, rest in peace. It's funny how some pieces of it want to keep coming back, at least from some people on the committee. ES5 is here. It's actually in all the modern browsers. It's i10 platform preview even has strict mode support. Um, we have some goals. It's important to know what you're doing and what you're not doing. So we're not trying to make everybody happy. We're, we're concerned that JavaScript has grown way beyond its original design point. It's used for incredibly complex applications, which involve factoring into libraries. The DOM should just be a library. It's got this privileged status with lots of weirdo host objects, but we're trying to tame those. It's, long project. It's happening through proxies, which I talked about a year ago at JSConf EU. The web IDL work that is being edited by Cameron McCormick is also helping. We're getting the Java OMG IDL stuff out of web IDL. And we're very concerned with code generators. So Mscripten, right? Or CoffeeScript, lots and lots of code generators. And they need, they need some language extensions. And I'm thinking more and more about this in connection with things like typed arrays and parallel arrays. Um, we have tests, which is amazing. There's a link there. We have test262.script.org. A lot of specs get produced without tests. These tests are not normative. They're not the final answer. They're like software. They're buggy, and they need to be continually evolved. But we have tests. That's pretty good. And we want to adopt standards you guys create. We want to see stuff emerge on GitHub and win. We don't want to invent it in committee, because no committee can do as good a job as the community. We want to keep our version story just like stepping up from strict mode one step and then not forking again. We're not going to have strict or strict mode. And this one's near and dear to Mark Miller's heart, of Mark Miller of Google Kaha fame. We want to repair JavaScript. It's almost there with ES5 strict so that it is a capability language, because that's the security model in JavaScript. The DOM has its own issues, but JavaScript actually has a fairly strong model if you fix a few things. So here's what's in ES6. You probably know this. Let is the new var. Const is like let, only you have to initialize it. You can't use it before it's initialized. Uh, and function can work in block scope in a standard way that's only in that block scope. The way it works in browsers now is, is wacky and different. Destructuring. This is for Alex Sexton, who can't be here because he's getting married. He, he wants destructuring. He wants something I'll get to on the next line. But destructuring is what you know from Python, and Ruby, unpacking, destructuring in ML. Uh, it's really sweet. There's an object shorthand that works if you're creating an object from free variables x and y. It looks just like that without the let on the left or the assignment on the right. Parameter default values, right? You've got to have these. Um, the first parameter x doesn't have a default value. The second one, y, has one as its default value. So if you call f with only one actual parameter, y will be bound to 1. And you can use 
parameters to the left. This is like prolog code in the function after it's been activated. So y could have defaulted to x or x times x or some expression involving x. And then the third formal parameter there is actually a destructuring pattern. It says that f, if it takes a third actual parameter, it should receive an object. And that object might want to have z and w as properties, but if it doesn't, individually one of those or both are missing, they will be defaulted. And that allows you to get rid of a lot of boilerplate you guys probably do where you look at the argument, you see if it has this property. You, you know, in CoffeeScript you would use uh, existential or conditional expressions. This is all wrapped up into destructuring and default parameter values. Rest, thanks. Rest and spread. We want to kill the arguments object. We can't kill it fast because a lot of code will migrate with it. It's a pain to rewrite. But once we put rest and spread in, we can think about killing arguments. It'll be down the road, but that's really good because now you'll get a real array. You don't have to do this crazy array.prototype.slice.call arguments jazz to turn it into an arguments object and copy it. You actually get in the dot, 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 r, you get bound to the r parameter, you get a real array. And if you want to turn an array into positional parameters and spread them out across an actual argument list, you can do that with dot, dot, dot prefix. It also works in array initializers, special form. Um, proxies, these are actually in V8 now, as well as SpiderMonkey. They're under a flag, but you can test them in V8. That's excellent news, and that means we can have interoperation testing, which we need. We're still tweaking the design a little in committee, but they're good. When you have proxies, you can do all sorts of amazing things. Sometimes you want to hang on to sort of cache or memoize objects, but not make them leak, not create memory leaks, not memoize the world. Weak maps are important for that. Modules, this is one of the biggest things, I think, in ES6. This is a, a second class, by default, module system. You can reflect on it. There's a dynamic lo module loader API, so when you have to go dynamic, you can do it. But the neat thing about this is when you're using modules and you're referring to their bodies loading from URLs, the JavaScript engine can see that. The parser can see that. Even a pre-parser can see it pretty easily. You can preload them. You can prefetch them. There's no more speculative jazz that we're doing now in browsers that doesn't always work out. You can actually make sure that all those dependencies are prefetched ahead of time and you never interrupt your schedule. You have to have, never have to write a callback function that captures the continuation of your whole program in order to do something with the, the module you loaded. It's all there. Um, iterators and generators, I mean, we had these in SpiderMonkey. We're tweaking the design a little bit. Like there's a star after the function keyword to remind you it is a generator function and it doesn't therefore need to have a yield in it at all. You can make an empty generator, just it's a good ba basis case for certain special forms. Uh, but this is pretty close to Python. It's like Python with a few fixes, simplifications. And we even talked to the Python guys about it and they approved. Uh, and then comprehensions, you know, these are just awesome. They're from Python. Notice there's a paren-free forehead in there and there's gonna be ways to mix uh, let bindings and have an if condition at the end. Pretty much like Python or ML or Haskell, um, but not, not uh, Haskell pure and, and all that stuff. Um, binary data, this is an embrace and extend on typed arrays. Typed arrays are already in every browser except IE, and I kind of have this feeling whenever I talk to the Microsoft guy that they might show up in IE, so you know, everybody who believes in fairies, clap your hands three times because I think they're coming. Um, and binary data is the ES6 extension of typed arrays where instead of making these flat arrays that are like Fortran, if you ever program in Fortran, where you actually have to lay down a bunch of UN32s in a row or doubles, and sometimes you have to overlay them to pretend you have a structure that has two UN32s and a double. That's just nuts. Instead, you can make these pretty composite data structures by describing the native machine types that are their members. You can build arrays of structs, structs of arrays, do it generatively, so that's what's happening here. Once you've newed up some constructors, you can call them. So new triangle can take an object literal, or an array literal in this case, containing object literals that provides all the data. Now, you might think, well, that's making twice the data. This can be optimized. You can also have constant arrays that are used for the default values. You can just make new triangle with no arguments, and you get a bunch of zeros, and you can then start setting things. The, the key point here is that you're able to describe memory in a machine integer and floating point packed format, and you can therefore talk to file formats over the file API, the blob APIs that are coming in the web API group. You can also talk to WebGL, you can talk to your GPU. Gotta have it. Quasi-literals, this, this was something that 
came at the last minute for ES6, and I'm glad it did. It was Mike Samuel uh, with Mark Miller helping at Google. We wanted to have multi-line strings. People were saying, why don't we have triple-quoted strings like in, you know, CopyScript or other languages. Um, we also wanted multi-line regular expressions, which would be free to embed almost any character because regular expressions have different backslash escaping rules. And we wanted to be safe uh, in our string formatting. We wanted to allow you to say, I want to have a message where I use a variable expanded as the noun, another one is the verb for you know, a localized message, but I don't want somebody to inject some nasty code into that variable that then gets evaluated and attacks me. So quasi-literal solve all these cases, we use the scarce accent grav backtick character, and it looked like this. There's a free variable in front, it's a free variable reference, it refers to a function. You define the function, it has to be in scope. And it's optional. If you don't add it, I'll show you what happens. But if you do provide that quasi, that's just a made up name, it could be anything, the function gets the literal portions quoted and kind of frozen and protected. It gets them both in the raw with their backslash escapes unprocessed, so you can do your own interpretation of most backslashes, and cooked where the standard string backslash escaping happens forms. And that, that object literal that's being passed in the desugaring, the, the bottom parallel, triple line there, is a constant. It's peculiar to the occurrence of the literal in the program. The final arguments are the substitutions that are actually in green. Those are whatever variables you want. We're, we're, we're still fine tuning how the grammar works so you can't be attacked. Probably it's safe to have expression forms it's like dotted member expressions, identifiers. Um, this is being specified. And you can have new lines embedded in these backtick quoted strings, so there's your multi-line string constant. If you don't put any quasi or other identifier in front, you're not calling a quasi function, you're getting a default behavior, which simply does the substitution and does the default string backslash processing. And that, yes, that was a new line. So here you have multi-line strings, no triple quoting, just back quotes. And think about multi-line regex, all you need is a special quasi handler, probably from a standard built-in module I called it RE here, we're gonna to have to do that. It's part of ES6, that's easy to do. That's not a difficult design problem. It's not gonna to be too controversial. Classes, I've been talking about classes since they supposedly made it, and the meeting last week we had um, of TC39 people was pretty contentious because there's still too many open issues in my opinion. But there is a, a pattern people use when they write the constructor prototypal pattern, they write a function that they mean to be called by new, in that function, they assign to this dot x and this dot y, they're making a point, say, and that function, say it's called capital P point, has a dot prototype object that contains all the shared methods, the prototype delegated methods. That expansion that people do by hand these days is a little awkward, especially when you have subclassing. You have sort of a convention like CoffeeScript compiles where you have a superclass and you can have super calls and you wanna get this right and it's, it's too much code to write by hand, it's a little error prone. So why not have class index? We're trying to boil it down to the simplest thing we can agree on and that isn't so simple and stupid that it's not worth doing. It's difficult. One of the things we factored out was private variables. Some people on the committee feel strongly classes should have things like constant instance variables and private members. And it's very hard to do this, but this slide shows on the very first line a separate proposal we've accepted for private name objects. These are a new thing in JavaScript. You know how in JavaScript you have objects where the properties are all named by strings, or equivalents of strings, like indexes. Same thing as if you quoted the number zero or one, you can use zero or one, but it's all string equated property identifiers. Private names in ES6 add another option to the property key type. It can be a private name object. This is an object with a unique identity. The identity is the, the key's value. When you make a private name object, and you don't give it out to anybody, it really is private. Nobody can find that on your object. They can't find it through 4in, they can't find it through ES5's object.getown property names, they can't find it anyway. Unless you give them the private name, and then I guess maybe it's a shared secret or even public, but it's unique. And so here, to show point with X and Y being private members, I show PX and PY being constants bound to fresh private name objects. And then to see how they're used, look down a little bit, you see they're being used with Bracketing, that's how you use a computed property name in JavaScript already, right? It's how you use array indexes, or if you have a string you compute, it turns out to be X or Y, that's a public name. In this case, it turns out to be the private names. And the rest of it's kind of verbose. You have this sub PX and this sub PY all over the place. In past slides, I've shown some sugar for this that 
kind of inspired by maybe Ruby or uh, CopyScript use at sign uh, as kind of an infix or even a, a prefix operator for the this case. We didn't agree on that. And so this, this is almost too little to do because it's kind of heavyweight, but maybe you don't need private names at all. A lot of people on the committee, not everyone, thinks, let's just show you what people do today. They use public names. If they want real privacy, they use closures. They use the closure pattern, which has its cost, but you can use it. So why are we killing ourselves over private names? And so we, we tried to factor it out. But there are still open issues like constant instance variables. Some people feel strongly you should be able to have constant variables in your class instances. And they should only ever be seen with their initial value. You should never see them with the undefined value. It should be an error to access them before they've been initialized. This is hard to get right. I'll get into this a little more. So <laughs> my colleague, Alan Weir Sprock at Mozilla, the editor of ES5 and ES6, some of you may remember he was at Microsoft, um, has come up with these simpler proposals for doing pieces of what classes do, also doing part of what non-standard extensions like the double under of our proto property, pseudo property I added years ago do, and triangle is one of them. And there's some, some issues with triangles, um, but mostly syntactic, I think. S semantically, they're, they're good. They're like creating a fresh object with double under our proto initialized. And this is unobjectionable to implementers. This is not going to mutate the prototype of your live object that people are already using as if it were you know, an apple so that it delegates to orange.prototype. This is just creating at birth a, a certain prototype chain. ES5 has object.create, where you can do this, but it's, it's long-winded compared to this. You have to give it the prototype as the first argument, and then you call object.create with a second argument that's a big property descriptor map, not an object literal. Here, you can just take the triangle operator, slap it between your base object and an object literal. And that means that object literal on the right can actually be reused, it can have its proto set, it is not ever gonna escape with, with its original proto value, which will be object.prototype. And the cool thing is this actually works for other literal object forms. You can have arrays that delegate to an intervening prototype object. So you can make sort of sub-arrays or subtypes of array, if you will. Um, do it for functions, it should work for regular expressions as well. Um, the literal uh, strings, numbers, and booleans are primitives in JavaScript, and we're still debating whether this should work for the object wrappers that you get automatically around those, but that's not really an important use case. The main thing about this is the triangle syntax doesn't look quite right. It, courier almost gets it right here, but the bar looks a little too tall. If you connect the, the lines, it doesn't quite line up. And um, so... <laughs> Keep going, bear with me. We're now looking at something else, which is inspired by prototype JS's object.extend. This is a method that's been in prototype and other libraries for a long time. It usually uses the for in loop. It has some issues there, but we want it to work by taking all the own properties from an object on the right and copying them into the object on the left. It's a little funky that there's no assignment operator. You have to know that this is a must, monocle mustache, this winking mustache guy is on his side is gonna mutate the base. Um, but, you know, roll with it for now. Um, and it gets all the own properties. So suppose you had those private name object identified properties, they would get copied too. And you can't do that with a foreign loop. So this is important to make a built-in. You want new built-ins that fill gaps in the language that you cannot fill yourselves. You cannot reflect on private name objects, but you, I think, want as a compositional operator this monocle mustache to get the private names. Um, wouldn't it be better if it just made a fresh object? I mean, we can worry about optimizing, uh, but it looks like an expression form of some sort. Doesn't necessarily mutate base, doesn't scream out, I'm gonna copy things into my left, left thing to the left of my monocle. But um, if we do that, then you have to capture the result in a new object. Or if you really want it to be clear that it's a mutating operator, why not use the assignment operator idiom from C that JavaScript inherited, lots of languages have. In this case, it would be dot equals instead of plus equals. We can't use plus equals, that's kind of taken. It does string conversion and string concatenation. Uh, that ship sailed a long time ago, unfortunately. So we're still arguing about what the right form is, and your input is welcome on ES Discuss. Your informed comments um, are welcome. Now, what Alan has done with these is he's made the class pattern without class syntax. So here it is all at once. There's the private names again, just to keep it parallel. And instead of class point, we have let point. And on the right, instead of point extends base, we have base triangle function, and the function is the constructor. And it looks just like the constructor from the earlier slide. 
But you also want to take the methods that were in the class in the earlier slide and put them on the prototype. So we use monocle mustache to do that. It's kind of pretty, not totally pretty though, but not totally awful. And then you want to end in the constructor because that's what you want to assign the point. You don't want point to refer to point that prototype. It has to refer to point the constructor function. So you then use dot constructor monocle mustache any static properties you might have. Here's an all points data property. You could have static methods. People like to put class methods. The built-in objects have them. You know, like um, date dot parse is one example. This almost works. I mean, people start to like this because they think I could actually live with this instead of class syntax, and I wouldn't have to hassle with standardizing classes, and, but it's a little fragile. If you get dot prototype section and the dot constructor section in the wrong order, then you end up assigning the prototype to point and then you can't new it. Um, and it's, it's, it's just boilerplate. You have to write the monocle mustache. You get dots in the middle of your, your, your class layout. It doesn't look as sweet as the ideal class syntax we haven't quite found looks. So, you know, syntax. I, I swear, when Go launched, I, I was excited about certain things, and then I realized it was a lot like previous raw pike languages, but worst of all, they kept blogging about syntax, and I thought, why are they talking about syntax? Who cares about syntax? That's like the last detail you want to worry about when you're designing a new language. But JavaScript's an old language, and it needs to be more usable, so syntax rises to the fore, and we on the committee can't just be egghead semanticists. We have to think about syntax and usability. I'm not particularly great at that. I'll talk more about that. Um, yeah, so triangle, monocle, long nose, mustache, um, if it's the dot equal thing. CopyScript has, has class that just desugars two prototypes on constructor functions. Why can't we? It's harder than you think to standardize. Um, funny operators, n maybe not, maybe they're good, maybe we need to find the right operators, but we still might want classes. And bike shedding is a constant threat, whereas instead of deciding what, you know, paint color to use for the unimportant bike shed, we really do have, you know, the atomic power plant in front that has important usability features we want to get right so it doesn't melt down. So we ought to be considering syntax carefully and interacting with the community on usability, which means to me we probably have to prototype this stuff. Um, and maybe have a beauty contest. You guys would have to get your hands on it to use it, I think, to really judge it. You, you could look at it, everybody has an opinion, right, but you really want to use it to decide. Let me talk about more syntax because, again, people get tired of function. I really regret this eight-letter keyword. I made JavaScript based on sort of C syntax, but I needed first-class functions and I didn't use fun or fn. I, I thought about fun and I thought it, it kind of wind up with a bar as a three-letter keyword, but it, it didn't match the, the Java gravitas of class extends and interface and it was, it was too short. So I used function, also inspired by awk. Function is too long. Uh, people are getting tired of it. If you only do a little JavaScripting or you write big functions with big bodies, maybe it's not a problem. If you write lots of functional JavaScript, you start seeing function, 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 it's, it's a pain in the ass. Now over the years, people have asked for funny characters again. Lambda and Florin are actually Unicode identifier characters, I believe, and cannot be used without breaking compatibility with somebody in Greece or, um, I don't know, Belgium, who uses Florin. Uh, it could happen though, and so I don't know if we want to do that. And it doesn't work well for other reasons that I won't get into, but there was also an idea that we should just use hash. And just hash is short for function. Wouldn't that really improve things? I don't, I don't think so, because part of the problem is well, we're running out of characters. We want hash maybe for something more universal later. Also, function is long as a keyword, but return is six more honking letters, and you have to have a space after parens around its operand. So pretty soon you're talking about, for functions that actually return values, 14 or more, maybe 15 characters when you could have one. Uh, so there's more to do than just shorten function. And so one idea which I've actually developed is straight from CoffeeScript because it's a cow path we could pave, though it's grammatically quite different and it's not validated in the same way that JavaScript is. It's, it's, it's a GitHub project, the code is the spec. Um, and Jeremy keeps tuning the sort of magic lexer and the rewriter phase and so on, um, which is cool, but it's not something we could standardize. But I, I worked on this enough that I got it so that you didn't have to use extra parentheses or braces. Um, but it requires some novel grammatical techniques that some people on the committee just don't want to take a chance on. So I'm kind of pessimistic about arrows. A fat arrow would bind this, just like in CoffeeScript. But I did a bunch of work on this. It's still a straw man in our wiki, um, and some people like it. To me, it's, it's, it's got some uphill battles in the committee on the grammatical validation front, and it's kind of only function syntax. And at this point, I want more, and name functions too. Uh, and so, I did some more work inspired by 
Ruby and Smalltalk to put block lambdas in without kind of the extra steps that Ruby put in where they have to you know, be passed down to certain functions and then they have to be procked out nude. And there's just complexity there we don't need. Instead, these would be a new kind of callable object. They're a built-in callable object, so type of says their type is function. That tells you it's callable. They have some of the things you expect from functions, like a dot length property for the number of expected arguments. They do not have a dot prototype. They do not have a construct internal method. You cannot new them. And that's important because they actually don't change the meaning of this in their bodies. They, in fact, don't change the meaning of a lot of things in their bodies. They have a property, some people call this tenant's correspondence principle, so that you can take a piece of code and wrap it in one of these things and call it right away, and it's as if you didn't wrap it at all. Uh, I think that's called ADA conversion. Um, so they're kind of cool. They, they can be used for iterators. They can be used like you would use them in Ruby. They can have control effects like returning from the enclosing functions. You can write your own outer function, capital F, uh, sorry, eight letter word function, and your inner block lambda that cooperates with it by returning a value, and that's what these examples show. Some people freak out because what this means is if you let one of these block lambdas escape and it returns from its enclosing function and then you call it later when the enclosing function is no longer active, you get a runtime error. It's sort of like having a throw in your code. I mean, runtime errors happen, especially with throws since ES3. I'm not freaked out by this, but it really bothers some people. So that's a challenge in the committee and probably in the community. Some of you are Rubyists, though, and you're probably like salivating. Um, and you know, why are we fussing about this? Um, so Michael Rogers had this quote I still like. Uh, I got 99 problems in JavaScript syntax ain't one. Um, that's Michael. But you know, there's, there's still a lot of disagreement. And people who program a lot of JavaScript and a lot of functional JavaScript do, do feel some pain. Um, it's not really writing so much as reading, though I'm sympathetic to both. Readability is the first consideration. Um, so, you know, we're not going to get arrows without some grammatical wonder work that I haven't figured out how to do in the committee. Block lambdas are actually closer because the grammatical purists don't mind them. They're, they're unproblematic. That curly brace bar helps. Um, you can have spaces, but it still helps. Um, and then some people just want to go back to, can't we just have a shorthand that's just an ugly character? I don't care about return or this. And that's, that's, that's warm beer. It's not going to fly in the committee. It's probably not going to fly with you guys. Um, so, you know, I have to ask myself, because we did defect from the what W3C to do HTML5. We did form the what WG with Opera and Apple back in 2004. Maybe something's wrong here, even if the committee is operating harmoniously. Uh, it's good to question how we work as well as the product. We, we do have this problem that we're a committee. We don't design if we can help it, but uh, apart from bike shedding temptation, we, we delegate champions and we try to codify de facto standards, but we're consensus driven, which means it's hard to reach general agreement, which is the definition of consensus. We also have long path dependencies, so we end up doing something like adding a special form where we could have a macro facility that lets it be a library. That, I think, isn't so big, that particular issue, because later on, if we have macros, you guys can go recast it without problem if we did our macro job right. But still, there's, there's, when you're doing this work, you're going down a path, and there are roads not taken, and it's hard to hop to a different path. So things like Dart maybe wonder, things like WebGL typed arrays in Scripton, should we take the typed array um, precedent and make some numeric extensions for JavaScript, some way of saying, I, I have an integer, not just a in32 type array, but an actual in32 variable. Might be good. It, it starts to smell like ES4, ActionScript 3, you know, Java with optional types. Uh, been there and done that. I don't really want to go there, but just for the hardcore type array stuff, maybe. Just for unscripted, maybe. For this being a better target for code generators goal, maybe. Um, and since we had this calling process and we may cut more of the proposals that did make it to ES6, some of those straw men, like block lambda revival, are still out there in straw state. But maybe they should be experimentally implemented so that under a flag you can try them and we can get more user feedback. Um, even that is hard because I think spider and V8 teams are all full up. They're busy doing the stuff we have approved. They don't want to try some random straw man that might fail. So maybe we should organize the community to do more prototyping. I know there are some, some really good hackers here who could actually extend V8 and SpiderMonkey, and JavaScript Core, for that matter, the other open source engine, to have some of these experimental features um, in a coordinated way. But, but the good news is that ES6 is being drafted, and that's a link to the page on the wiki where you can find the emerging drafts. There are Word documents and PDFs. You can diff them if you use Word. You can look at them in PDFJS if you want. Um, and 
we're, we're making progress. People don't believe this. They think, oh, the committee's off again in the weeds. It'll never happen. But it's being prototyped in V8. It isn't just Mozilla, you know, the holy fools adding the spider monkey in the vain hope they get standardized. It's actually coming along. And I expect it'll show up in Apple and Microsoft. You never can tell, but I think they'll implement a lot of this too. They're actually keen on things like uh, binary data. Um, so that, this is all good news and we can even afford to cut. Um, and we really are worrying about syntax like I swore I wouldn't do. And I, I think that's a bad uh, role for the committee. I think it's better for the community. So we need to interact somehow. And, and I, I, I want to find the, the, the pretty and usable syntax. I know it's out there. Um, so let me talk about something new that I did talk about and blog about recently, but I'll show you the demo. And it, this is also, I think, connected to what Alone is doing because Emscripten could certainly use that parallel hardware too. LVM actually connects to OpenCL through some work NVIDIA did. Um, so there is a great opportunity here to do a fast path where you can have C++ or whatever language you want that has a compiler with an LVM backend and out comes not only JavaScript, but maybe parallel JavaScript. Uh, and the Intel researchers added a parallel array library. There's one of those in Java, so they were maybe inspired by that, but it's not a bad thing. It's like typed arrays, only um, no methods mutate any of the elements. You can't write to any of the elements. And that makes it easy to do the, the data flow analysis, and you really are just throwing out work, doing uh, work stealing on your CPUs, you're doing instruction selection on your short vector units, that's what the demo uses. And ideally, you could map it to your GPU, I think that'll happen. So here are the methods, um, they all produce fresh results. That means that this isn't just a library. If you run this as a library, it's slow. But if you run a special compiler over it, JavaScript to OpenCL is the current technique. But this could be done in the JITs. The current JavaScript engines could actually do this analysis. You can actually generate, maybe you want to use OpenCL because it knows how to, to map to your hardware and it's a sort of a porting layer. Or maybe you just wire it into your JIT. It knows how to generate the right instructions for your, your multi-core vector units, your, your GPU with its massive floating point parallelism. Um, and the source is on GitHub. That's really awesome. Intel's doing work on GitHub. I mean, I, who knew? Um, they have another thing. They have a SPIMD compiler. They're, they're just doing stuff. Uh, th there's a place in the demo code, they hired some consultants who didn't know how to use strict and it caused some errors, so they put do not use strict in quotes. It was funny. Um, and it, it shows that a string literal useless expression statement really is useless unless it happens to be used strict. So be careful with your use strict. They, they do have meaning. Um, in Harmony, you'll have to take away the quotes and then you get guaranteed semantics. It isn't just a useless string expression to old, old browsers. Uh, the parallel array constructor builds on typed arrays. This is more embrace and extend. Maybe this will change. This is just a technology demonstrator. But the way it works looks like JavaScript, right? You're just doing new parallel array. You're setting up a bunch of state for your asteroid particle system thingy. Um, using combine instead of plus equals is kind of a mouthful, but this is where the magic happens because this is where you can actually farm out the work across multiple elements in a short vector or across even parts of a GPU, across multiple cores. And you can take your loops that use these operations, you can also split them and farm them out. Um, everything is immutable, so the dependencies are easy to figure out. Um, and that makes me think that JS is underrated because when I did it, it was first a toy or useless. Even in 2006, Andreas Gal had a paper rejected by a referee, it was like a CGO conference, who said, JavaScript is a toy and performance doesn't matter. And this was like 2006. I mean, Gmail was out, Google Maps. Um, but you know, JS was too slow. You needed ActionScript 3, you needed Silverlight, I don't know, something, but that's not true. Um, it couldn't be fixed. Well, we're fixing it. We're making progress in the committee. Ain't going to be the prettiest thing, but not sure anything that's got the reach of JavaScript can be that pretty because it has to be compatible roughly over time. You can break things slowly and put in new things like spread and rest, but it takes time. And they said it couldn't do, you know, parallel hardware. We need a new language for that. You know, we're embedding WebCL unsafely in, in web pages. We're, we're going to put magic domain-specific languages into strings in JavaScript where they can be unchecked. That's a good experiment too, but it's, to me, it's not appealing. It's unsafe, it's unchecked. With parallel arrays, we can do better. So I say always bet on JS, and I'm going to show you the River Trail demo now. And this is a pretty particle system. But when it starts, you'll see it's using sequential execution, which is slow. And there come some particles, and it, it's just painful. And the frame rate eventually on the right there will pop up, and it's not good. But if you click on parallel, then... Yeah. 
And I think my fans are going to turn on now. <laughs> because it is lighting up. I mean, all the silicon and all four cores on this big, beautiful Mac are, are chugging away. Um, so, yeah, always bet on JS. Any questions? Brian. Yeah, and script has to do like or zero or whatever all over the place. It's crazy. Um, so I alluded to that with the idea of numeric extensions for JavaScript. Given the typed array storage types, you, you do kind of want arithmetic evaluation intermediate types and, and even uh, local variable types, which I'm willing to consider all the possibilities. Like your phones have GPUs with 16-bit floats on them. Maybe we need those. It, it starts to get messy if you make a numeric tower where there are implicit conversions that lead to loss of precision or crazy unsigned contamination. That, I think, is to be avoided. Maybe we should have no implicit conversions. You should have to explicitly convert. Uh, I'm thinking about making this proposal, and this is another one of those late proposals that might be more important than some of the stuff we're working on for ES6. So look for more on my blog about this. I'm serious about this. It, it, it's, Relevant to the typed array and parallel array work, it's relevant to Emscripted and a bunch of other code generators. Um, sounds like Dart's got multiple numeric types, so you know, got to keep up with the Joneses. Um, yes. Wow, time for beer. If Oracle are bothering people about like the Java trademark, why not make JS official? Good idea. You know, the problem is JS.org is, um, I think it's like uh, Jerusalem Synoptic Studies.org or something. I mean, it, it, JS is a little short, but how do you like that, that uh, black and yellow logo? Is that good? All right. I, I thought about, and I actually, tried to negotiate with some domain squatter for, for certain names, because I think JS is a strong, short name, and we could have that community group that does have a hacker elite that extends the open source engines beyond what their owners can afford to do to experiment with stuff. Thinking about it. Thanks. So. My fan is on. So could that mean that Mozilla might apply for a JS TLD? Put some money into it? I thought JS TLD, wow. All right. Hadn't thought of that one. <laughs> we'll look into it. Cool. Um, so what's the kind of the... I suppose the backwards compatibility story. Are we gonna do what tra Tracer does and have like a or CoffeeScript have this kind of converter which will always go back to JavaScript? Or yeah, uh, it's in plan, and there was already Tracer. I don't think that's being maintained now. But the idea is to take um, the next version of JavaScript and compile it down to the current version all the browsers support. There's going to be some performance effects, mm -hmm. but that's better than not running. And if you really want to target current version until the new version is widely adopted, you can always do that. I keep saying this because people say, well, we have to wait four years, so there's no point in doing anything. But that's not true. Sometimes it's less than four years. The web can evolve rapidly. And with the move to mobile, I think it will. Cool. Thank you. Hi. Um, when it comes to the question of syntax, uh, I feel like maybe a better move would be to work on features for JavaScript to make itself a better target for other languages like CoffeeScript compiling into it. Right now, you can't really use it for test-driven development. Uh, you can't really use any of the CoffeeScript stuff because the stack traces are just totally meaningless. And I think the, both WebKit as well as Mozilla has bugs open for like a proposal to annotate source code with line numbers from other languages that yep. generated them. Is that something ECMA? Uh, script 6 would address? Sort of. I, I actually worked on the patch for that, which is under review, and it's going to land soon for Firefox, I don't know, something. Um, and that is, that, that, that's called source maps. It's what the closure compiler generates, and that's a good idea. I don't want to standardize yet, because it's still something that only like the closure compiler and 
Spider Monkey and maybe uh, WebKit or, or Chromium Patch uh, that might be going forward is doing. Um, I think Spider Monkey is going to have it first, but we want to support good source coordinate mapping. So when you get an error, when you are debugging, you can project back to your CopyScript source. Uh, other than that, I think CopyScript is good for test driven development. And these numeric extensions will be good for CopyScript. Triangle would be good for CopyScript because CopyScript wants to do Ruby-esque class-side inheritance. When you make a subclass, you inherit the superclass's class methods. And Triangle does that magically when you use it with a function on the right. So some of this is relevant. So yeah, just a question on the um, mscriptum versus native client versus extending JavaScript. Because of the, um, let's say, the performance characteristics of both memory size and CPU speed, um, there is going to be a, a class of applications that are going to drive the adoption, right? So the, you have to have a killer app for, to use this technology. Um, so how do you see the, um, the performance balance? For instance, it's great that it can cross-compile to JavaScript, but if you know, the only browser that runs it fast enough is you know, maybe two browsers or one and a half, is it still, is it still uh, competitive? Because if I run it on an iPad, maybe it runs like half a frames per second, which yeah, I got disqualifies this, though, it. Native client ain't coming to iPad, ever. <laughs> so that's really not a c comparable good. But, but, half, but, but half it, a frames but, per second isn't either, so then you don't care. Right, so if this becomes a hot issue, pun intended, um, then I think competition will drive these devices, and they will get faster and more multi-core architectures with bigger caches, and we will see them running these, these more aggressive apps, but you have to go through this competitive cycle. There's no shortcut on the web, and that's why I, I say I always bet on JS, because the shortest path, which alone is taking with Inscripton, which we're doing with these parallel array extensions, is to extend the web as it is, not try to do a replacement on part of it or all of it. That trick never works. Um, Brandon, um, some time ago you sent me um, this link to this um, suggestion of an uh, dict API. You remember? How's the state about that? It's a straw man. It didn't make the cutoff. Um, Dave Herman did some great work making a dict API. It's actually a, a literal syntax. You put brackets around, you know, key colon value property initializers. Instead of cr squiggly curly braces, you use square brackets. Um, kind of cool because it's only a dictionary, you get string or string equated keys and values, you get no object up prototype, we can decide if we want it to be extensible or not, we probably should. Um, it acts more like what a Python dict is, but how do you make an empty one? Square brackets by themselves make an array, Dave started adding pipes, it, it, it got weird and it was a little late and it just didn't make it, so we're going to keep working on it. The straw man stuff is still ground we're turning over. We're still trying to grow some beautiful plants or pony corns there, so don't give up, but keep the feedback coming. Uh, about the TC339, uh, do you think that we'll come to a conclusion of having more open from external contributions? Like, we have an already a mailing list, and there is clearly evolution on that, but as I'm trying to implement some spec and I find high difficult to get the dirt, that test, test, test suite running. So... Yeah, uh, sorry, I didn't know which test suite you meant, but there, there is a problem with openness. ECMA, like all standards bodies, has been talking about openness and sort of moving toward openness, but it's, it's gradual. W3C actually got severe pressure from the WhatWG, which let any individual, well-behaved individual, be a member in standing. So now I think the HTML working group is like that, which is good, it makes for a certain noise level, only Hixie can really keep up, so he usually wins. Not sure about that, you know, I like Hixie, he did the job we picked him for when he was still at Opera in 2004. Um, I'm not gonna pick on him, because I think he did the job, basically, and I'm happy with it mostly. But I don't know how you, re re you redo that. Do you find another Hixie somewhere? It's hard. ECMA is not going to let any individual be a member in good standing, but we created ES Discuss at Mozilla to let everybody participate. And a bunch of us, not just me at Mozilla and others, but people at Google, take input seriously and take it back. And Alex Russell has tried to incorporate some of the people who might be around when we meet to come to our dinners. And I think we're gonna keep trying that. No games, you know, not trying to play politics, just get, get more voices of the community heard. But maybe the best idea is the .js domain or the js.org. Take a less hostile approach than WebWG, but do make sort of an advanced scouting organization out of the community. And be serious about it. Try to be coordinated. Make some extensions to the open source engines. 
argue until you, somebody wins or the right, right design comes to the surface, and scale it out better than the committee can do. Because the committee is understaffed. Um, it does seem like we're losing a few Googlers. I don't know if that's because of DART or not. I think not. Um, we're just going to never do as good as the community can do if the community is harmonious and coordinated. Uh, hi. We had a um, conversation about C types. So I'm the guy that was trying C types to oh, yeah. simulate what you what yes. you've done there. Yes. Um, ES6 uh, looks cool, but it seems to be split in two main things. One is this binary data, this structure array, this parallel stuff, which, which is amazing. And everything else is syntax. By any chance, we can have, as soon as possible, at least the part that can make things faster. And think about syntax after, maybe, or yeah, split. Yeah, so the, the problem the, is that the, there, there are two problems. One is certain members of the committee don't want to leave you all using CoffeeScript or a compiler, they want to attend to the usability problems that are in the language. Function's too long, there are a bunch of them. Writing the class boilerplate's a problem. It's not the biggest problem, but it is a problem. So if we make people wait, they're gonna wait a long time, and that's the second problem. The overhead of the standards process, which has some value in the release of patents and then governments respecting ISO protocols, that has fairly high overhead. You cannot do really fast turns of the crank because the overhead dominates your schedule and you have no room left to actually do any work. So we're aiming at ES6 in 2013. It'll be prototyped well before then. It'll probably be not even under a flag in V8. I hope it'll just be turned on because parts of it, anyway, will be uncontroversial. And they're already in, on in, in SpiderMonkey. We'll get some of that in JavaScript core. You'll see it coming. Now, if the, the things that come first are the make it faster, maybe even these numeric extensions, then we win. So that's why I think the community interaction is most important because our prioritization, not just on the committee, but among the implementers, at all the browser vendors needs to be informed by the community. All right, thank you, Brendan. Thanks.